Father, thank you. Thank you that you are a good God. Thank you that we are able to call you Father and call you friend. We thank you for your word that you have given us, Lord. We thank you for being able to, to read it and, and letting it touch our hearts when we need encouragement and to build us up when we need build up, um, to admonish us when we need admonished, Father, to correct us when we need corrected. We thank you for your word, Lord. Uh, we pray for your hand all over today's service, Father, that your word would weigh on our hearts, that it would change us and shape us. It's alive and active, and it has the ability to do that. Lord Jesus, we just pray that it would today. Now, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. So I love dogs. Love dogs. Always have. Um, you know, I've, I've talked to you guys before. One of the rules that we have in our house is we don't watch movies with dogs in them. Because the one reason for that is the dog always dies at the end. Always. And we just don't need that kind of negativity in our life, so we don't put those movies on in our house. I mean, what's up with Hollywood when they come up with that stuff? Why does the dog always die? They can do anything. The dog dies. Make old yeller, I am legend, I'll, I'm not going to get started. Good vibes today. Um, but I love dogs. They're, they're loyal, always happy, um, always happy to see you. They're protective over you. Just great animals. Uh, we used to, have, used to have five. As many of you know, we were living in our car um, for years with those five dogs. I could tell you all kinds of stories about the chaos that ensued and came with that. But we would spend lots of times at, uh, at dog parks. They would let us stretch and get out of the car for a while. Not only for us, for the dogs. And living in a car, <laughs> in a cramped car, would, for the dogs is not a fun experience either. But it would give them a chance to play and, and run, bark at other dogs, bark at gopher tortoises they had down there in Florida. Uh, we would know where, where all the parks were in the area. We didn't have to look at a map after a while. We just started taking the roads to get there. We knew which roads to take that would lead us there. Um, here's the thing, though. We started learning those roads, but so did our dogs. When they saw that we were on a road that would take us to a park, they would go crazy. Crazy, man. There's no calming them down. Chaos ensued when we hit one of these roads. It got really bad. They started barking real loud, and we had a couple of hound dogs. So a couple of the dogs were howling in the car. Uh, they were jumping from the back to the front and the front to the back, um, scratching at the doors and the windows to get out. We're not even there. We're just on a road that leads there. And they would do this until we got there and, and we were able to get them in a fence. Five of them and a Chevy Cobalt going crazy. It was all we could do to keep the car on the road. And we would, we would be all scratched up when we got out of the car. So what we ended up doing was making sure we avoided these roads at all costs. That would trigger them. We would just avoid any of these roads that would lead them there. If we could, we would go the long way around. We would find different ways to get to where we were going because we knew that if we took them uh, the other way, they would, it would just bring chaos and destruction, that as soon as we were on the road, they recognized they would be tempted to lose it. So we intentionally led them away from it, which is in line with what we're going to be talking about today, the Lord leading us away from temptation and sin. Uh, Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So today we're going to jump back in to the Sermon on the Mount. Specifically, we're going to be in the Lord's Prayer on the, the Sermon on the Mount. So as we have went over the, the Lord's Prayer and, and what it means the purpose for it, we have discovered that it's not just about repeating the same words over and over. That was never the intention of, of the Lord's Prayer. There's nothing, nothing wrong with repeating Scripture over and over if that's what you choose to do, as long as you know what you're saying and why you're saying it. 
but the Lord's prayer is the Lord teaching us how to pray. Laying a foundation for how to address who it is we're talking to and how to talk to him, how to have a conversation with him. We talked in the first verse that when he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, that we should always acknowledge when we're talking to God, that we're talking to an all-powerful, all-knowing God who is holy and majestic, and we should speak to him and about him with reverence and in awe. But also, as Jesus says in this prayer, with the closeness of a father. The next verse says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We learned that while we were praying, we should seek for his will to be done over our own. Give us this day our daily bread is, is Jesus telling us that God wants us to ask and depend on him for what we need to live the life that he has called us to live. Not just material things, but spiritual as well. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors is that Jesus saying that we should seek God's forgiveness every day when we stumble, when we do wrong things in his eyes. And when we fall short, which we will, that he is ready and willing to give that forgiveness. But he also expects us to forgive others. And that leads us to the last verse of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So at face value, and just looking at it for what it says, it's pretty simple. To lead us away from temptation. Deliver us from evil. Now I've heard it said that, that if you don't pray this, that God is, God is going to lead you into, te- into temptation. That's not what it means at all. It doesn't mean that if you don't ask God that, he will lead you toward evil and, and temptation. God would not do that. James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So what this verse is saying is that you are acknowledging evil and temptation are present in your life, and you need the good shepherd's help to navigate away and through that. So let me ask you, when you think of temptation in your life, what do you think of? I mean, odds are we all think of something totally different when we think, when we come to this word. I mean, we know in our lives where we're weak and what we need the Lord's help in navigating away from. For me, and this isn't the only thing that I'm weak in, but the big thing in my life is I think of drugs. The Lord took that addiction away but I'd be foolish to think that temptation doesn't just rear its ugly head because I know my weakness and so does the enemy. We all have things that we're prone to, sins that we're, we're more susceptible to than others. And Jesus is saying that when we pray, we ask him to lead us away from that so that we don't become entangled in sin. So in other words, as the illustration I use would say, asking him to drive the car away from the roads that would lead to the dog park. Keep that in prayer as, as you pray to him, your personal temptations and asking Jesus to lead you away from him. Here's where it's a bit more complicated for us. Temptation to sin is the way that the world operates. It's literally everywhere. It's everywhere. So much so that the Bible says that creation even cries out to be set free. Romans 8, 20 to 22, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. You know, there's so many things that a follower of Christ should steer clear from that the world makes a way of life. You know, we're tempted to hear that and kind of shake our heads and become judgmental really quick. But let's remember that for those that don't know Jesus, for those that haven't been to the cross, there is no reason that they should be trying to live like they do know him. 
It would be like a Muslim saying to a Christian, why are you doing that? The, the Quran forbids that. Why are you doing that? We're not Muslims, so why would we care what the Quran says? Right? It's the same thing when we expect people who aren't Christians to act like Christians. We can't expect people to, that don't know Jesus to live like Christians when they've made no commitment to do so. Um, you know, I didn't, I don't have this in my notes, but this has come up and I'm, pr- I'm sure everybody's very aware or most people are pretty aware of it. Uh, and I've been praying about it, man, because I didn't know how to address this. I wanted to, to address it with wisdom and um, the right way, the way that, that the Lord would, would want me to. Um, so a couple of days ago was the Olympic opening ceremony, and uh, they had, had the drag queen show, and what they did during it was they did a, a rendition of the, the Lord's Supper, the drag queens did. And, um, you know, for us that know Jesus, we, we know what the Bible says, and we, re- we see that, and it, we're taken back. And then I'm, I'm reading a, an interview with the person that, that did it, uh, that, that choreographed this whole thing. And uh, there's no mistake about this. It was absolutely a shot at Jesus. It was. Our response, a lot of times, to that, to that kind of thing, I think that we need to acknowledge and remember, first and foremost, that God is a God of justice. God is, is holy and reverent like we had talked about. And justice will happen in one of two ways. They will, will deny Jesus, and they will... They will pay for what they have done, for mocking the God of the universe. Or two, and this should be all of our prayer, is that justice will be poured out on the cross for them when they repent of their sins and what they have done. You know, I, um, we, can, we can handle this thing in two ways. We can be, and we're going to talk more about it. I don't, I don't mean to to sum all of this up in one little section of a sermon today, and I, that's not my intention. But I, I want you to remember this. We can handle this in, in a few ways. One of them is when I was praying about this, and I felt the Lord really laying this on my heart. You know, I went to, um, to Matthew 24, and, it, and Jesus is talking about that the love of many will grow cold because law, lawlessness will increase. For our parts, we need to guard our hearts with love. We cannot, cannot let the way that an unbelieving world acts make us bitter and, and grow angry towards people that need to know Jesus. We should be praying for him to reveal himself to them and to, to bring them to the cross. We cannot let our love grow cold. We cannot. We need to, to see Jesus for who he is. And when we see that, we see the world for what it is, a world that desperately needs Jesus, and we need to be moved with compassion for them and not, not anger. I'm not saying don't stand up and, and say something when something needs to be said. But you know what, this, this, this kind of thing shouldn't surprise us. This is the way the Bible talks that things are going to get. Things are going to increasingly be this, and people are going to more and more openly mock the God of the universe. This is what's going to happen. The Bible has laid this out in front of us. It should not surprise us that this happens. But for our part, we believe there is power in prayer. So we pray, and we ask God to move on, on the hearts of those that don't know him. We ourselves were like that once, did not know God, and we needed him to, to save us. And we should be moved with compassion for those that don't know him. So I just, I ask that you, you pour into Jesus and who he is.
keep your, your love hot, burning for the world, a world that desperately needs Jesus. So to get back to it, um, we who know Jesus, we have a, a heavy, heavy task ahead of us. We have deep waters to navigate. We are, are called to be a hope and a light to others that don't know Jesus. And at the same time, to not fall into the sin that the world has fallen into. All this while the devil is constantly throwing darts at us, man, of, of temptation. It's dangerous, to say the least. So much so that Jesus says that we need to keep this a part of our regular prayer life. You know, we talked about about praying and asking Jesus to deliver us from the temptations that we know we're prone to. Absolutely, we have to have that. It's a great and good thing. Keep doing it. But I think a mistake that we make is that we focus on that and that alone. And it leaves us open to so many other temptations that are in our flesh that are there. Um, have you ever heard of a, a faint in boxing and MMA? Um, so what happens is the fighter will, will pummel you with one certain punch. He will just keep doing the same punch over and over, say a, a straight right, a straight right hand, and he will keep hitting you in the face with it and hitting you and hitting you and hitting you with it. He wants you to see him hitting you with it. And he wants you to block it at There comes a time you've got pretty good at seeing him throw it. Now you see it coming and you start to block it. As soon as he starts throwing that punch, man, you're blocking it. You're blocking it right away. You're anticipating it and now you start blocking it early. Fighter sees this. He knows that that you're watching for it. He knows that you're blocking it as soon as he starts throwing it. So after a while, when it's, it's second nature for you to block, he throws a feint, which is a fake punch which means that he starts to throw it, but doesn't. He just wants you to block it. And then when when you're focused on that punch that you think is coming, he hits you with the left, and it does all the damage, and he was setting you up for it the whole time. During this, you only see what you think is the biggest problem, that straight right that has kept hitting you and hitting you and hitting you. And you put all your focus on that, forget that he's got something winding up to hit you with. Sometimes the enemy attacks like that with temptation. He keeps us focused on, on one thing so that we don't see the other attack coming. He's tricky, man. He's been doing this for a long time. So what the Bible tells us in 1 Peter, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So we stay watchful knowing that temptation is everywhere. It's everywhere, man. Have you seen the world and what is thrown at us right now? It's crazy. I mean, the way the world operates is in one word, selfishness. I'm not saying that all people who don't know Jesus are selfish. In fact, I know some people who don't believe in God at all who are some of the most selfless people I know, who are more selfless than a lot of Christians I know. If I made eye contact with you while I said that, it was completely incidental. I wasn't trying to call you selfish for everybody. (laughs) But the the world operates this way. And, And here's what I mean. The world sells everybody a lie that you need to do what you want to do, and that's gonna make you happy. Do what's best for you, and you alone. Like, everything is permissible in the world now. It's crazy, man. Cheat on your spouse as long as you're happy. Go have sex with all kinds of random people as long as you're happy. Go get a divorce and leave your family. As long as you're happy, it's about you. Be that, the happiest version of you that you can be. Spend all of your money on luxury things to show others that you have money because that's what life is all about. It's how everybody else thinks about you. That's what's important. Fit in with the crowd, talk this way, act this way, direct this way, dress this way, eat this way, as long as you're happy, be unhealthy, as long as you are your own person. 
The world is holding your hand as it leads you to death. And guess what, though? We're all tempted by this. All of us. Since we've inherited the, a sinful flesh, we all have and desire selfishness. There's something deep down that desires our own wants and desires and our own desires over others and over what God wants. It's inherent in our sinful flesh, man. It's, Paul talks about it time and time again throughout the Bible. So it's important to know this because as the world operates in a sinful way, something in us, our flesh wants to follow that. And we have to fight against this. There are a, a few ways to do this. One, when the enemy throws darts of, of temptation at you, identify it for what it is and throw it out. Have you ever seen um, a movie called Kill Bill? Anybody? No? Yeah, a few people. Good, good. So at the end of Kill Bill, um, he shoots Beatrice with a truth serum dart in her leg. And she can't take it out. He tells her, he, in fact, he tells her if, if she does, he's going to shoot her with another one. And these things don't feel good. But the longer this thing stays in her leg, the more it makes her truthful, which is the whole reason that it needed to stay there. It's the same way with the enemy's lies that he throws at us and the darts that he, he shoots us with. The longer that thing stays there, the, longer, the more work it's going to do in us. The longer it stays in you, the more effective it becomes. Identify it for what it is. Throw it out as soon as you can. The second is just what Jesus tells us to do in here. Pray that the Lord would shepherd us away from temptations and evils that are all around us to keep us aware of danger. You know, the Lord will work through and honor your prayers as you cry out to him and acknowledge that you need him. <clears throat> I think, uh, I think a way that he does that, a way that he does that, and, and in fact, I've made this a part of my prayer life. I think the big way that, that he takes and steers, steers us clear of temptation is he takes our eyes off of it and puts it onto him. So we should ask him to do that. Ask him to put our eyes on him. You ever drive down the road and take your attention off the road, what's in front of you. You do that for very long, what happens? Soon, you start steering that way. Your car starts going that way. You start looking at distractions, and your car is in the side of the road, in the ditch. All because of what you took your eyes off of what they were supposed to be on. Temptation works the same way. To look at temptation, to look at temptation, we have to take our eyes off of the road or off of Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we have to take our eyes off of Jesus. And just like a car in the ditch, soon we end up in a place that we never should be when we do that. But if we fix our eyes on Jesus, if we keep them on him, we won't go to the left or to the right. We go straight towards him, which is right where we should be going. And soon we end up safely at our destination. Now, here's the good news on this. Jesus is better than any temptation that the world can throw at us. We're denying what the world has to offer, yes, but we are getting something so much better in him. What the world, apart from Jesus, has to offer is garbage. Philippians 3.8 says, Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And you know, the, the English language and the way that we do things in America, we try to pretty things up. Rubbish is a, a stronger word. I will put it that way. Look it up. <laughs> but he counts it as as refuse because he has Jesus. We have Jesus, man. 
Jesus. We're, we're, we're taking off the bread tie ring on our finger and we're putting on a diamond. Like putting down dog food and going into a nice steak restaurant. You know how amazing it is to know Jesus? To know Jesus. Have you ever sat and thought about it? Like people see or talk to a celebrity and they freak out. They just freak out. It's crazy. Just, just lose it. People even faint. I remember back in the day, New Kids on the Block was a thing. Anybody know New Kids on the Block? Yeah, yeah. See, now I'm judging y'all. People know New Kids on the Block, but they don't know Kill Bill, okay? No judgment, just joking. But anyways, back in the day, people would faint. They would show videos. Like, they would see New Kids on the Block, block these girls were, and they would just pass out, man. It was nuts. Those are just people. We know. We know the God of the universe. Know him. Like we actually know him. He calls us friend. He knows everything about us. Everything. Read, make it your mission tonight. Go home and read Psalm 139. That's about you and your relationship with the Lord. He knows the hair on our head. In my case, that's not too hard to know. He knows how many I've lost, though. He knows our, our struggles, our pains, our insecurities. He even knows the insecurities that we hide from those who are closest to us. And you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody's got them. He knows those, and he loves us. And... and he created everything that ever existed, man. Like we talk about how, how powerful God is and what, what he has done. And I've, I've talked to you guys about this before. They say, um, scientists say that, that the world, and there's proof of it because everything is growing farther apart. The universe is is growing, just becoming bigger and bigger at like an exponential rate of speed. It's crazy. Like it just keeps growing and growing and growing. So for us, we know God and we know that God created that universe that keeps growing, which means that he created it when he first spoke the universe into existence. That, that command, that when he just uttered it, was so powerful that to this day is still moving. It is still creating the universe. We know him. We know him. We've been talking to him and about him since we've been in here, singing songs to him. He's been here with us, dwelling with us. He's going to go home with each of us. We fellowship with him, talk with him, walk with him. And here's what I found in my, my relatively short walk with him. So the more I see of him, the more I know about him, the more I want to see and the more I want to know. When, when we read about his majesty and his power and his glory and all that the Bible says about him, it just leaves us in awe, right? But when we feel all of that power go down to the gentlest touch when we need him the most. Or the softest whisper when we're lonely. Or we feel his, his overwhelming love when we don't deserve it. Or see his faithfulness in our life when we haven't been faithful. When we see Jesus for who he is, is like when you've been in a really dark room and you walk out into the sunlight on a really bright day. You can't really focus on anything else. It overwhelms you. And the brightness is so bright that, that it makes you squinch your eyes. You couldn't focus on anything even if you wanted to. That's seeing Jesus for who he is. Temptations 
simply have no place or room in your life when he is where, where he should be, when we're seeing him for who he is. The worship team would, would come forward. You would stand with me. Um, we're gonna pray. And we're gonna put the Lord's prayer into motion as we pray today. So if you could, let's go ahead and, and bow our heads and pray together. Father, good and powerful, creator of the, the heavens and the stars and the universe, spoke and it was done. We thank you and we praise you, God. You are a good God and you are good to us and we get to call you Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, as we go about our days and our weeks, we pray that your will be done in our life, Father. That your hand be all over what we do because we knew what we do in our, our shallow way that we see things is, is here and gone but what is done for your kingdom, that is eternal. We ask that your will be done in our life and in this earth. We pray for your provision in our life, Father. Father, we need, we need your provision to live. Lord, you command the, the air that is in our lungs right now. You, it's you who gives us strength. It's you who gives us the food that we eat daily. We also ask for your peace, Father, we need it. We ask, Father, when we stumble, God, that you would, you would show us where we fall short and where we're stumbling. And as we do those things, Father, that, that you would remind us that you are there and you are waiting with open arms for us to just run and seek you in it, Lord Jesus. Thank you that for the blood that you poured out on the cross, that you are so willing and able to forgive us for anything that we have done, and we thank you for that, God. I pray that you would keep our hearts soft, Father, that we would forgive others, those who wrong us, those who will wrong us in the future, that we would be quick to forgive them as you have forgiven us, Lord. Father, temptation is everywhere in this world. It's everywhere. It's in, on commercials, on the internet. It's on the road, on signs on the road. It's on bumper stickers. God, it's, it's in every store we go into, there's temptation. We ask that you would take us away from temptation and keep our eyes on you, Lord Jesus. Keep them focused on you. You are beautiful and you are good and you are ours. What an amazing thing it is to say that, that you are our God and that we are yours. We thank you for that, God. Father, I pray over my brothers and sisters today uh, that you would watch over them and protect them, Lord. Keep them safe. Keep them safe as they go home. For those that are here from from out of town, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would keep them safe on the way home. Um, get them back home safe and sound, Lord. Let their trip be filled with, with peace and laughter and growing closer to you and growing closer to each other, Lord. We pray for our brothers and sisters who aren't here today, Lord, that you would just come up alongside them and um, bring healing and peace and love in their life. Help us as a church to, to come up alongside them as well, Lord Jesus. We thank you, we praise you. Jesus, in your name we pray, Lord. Amen.